Good afternoon. Welcome to our service of worship here today as we gather together to worship God. Uh, I trust that as we do so that you will be blessed and that God will be glorified. A couple of things by way of announcement. You, you should have all been uh, given an announcement sheet on your way in. I'd just like to uh, draw your attention to a couple of items. Once again, can I can encourage you to come uh, to join with us on Wednesday evening uh, via Zoom uh, for the midweek Bible study and prayer meeting. Uh, where we continue to look at Daniel, as I've as I've said before, the um, there are study study notes available on the church website for you to download. Even if, so, if you don't have a booklet and you think that prevents you from coming, please do not let that prevent you. You can download those study notes uh, and uh, uh, join with us. So please do so. Our youth club. Uh, uh, as you, you see there, we're planning to uh, start on the Friday the 5th of November. And uh, for that first evening, we would there, we there to assist with the registration. It would be great if we had a, a few extra people uh, to help us out on desks, sending reg or filling in registration forms or assisting parents to fill in their registration forms. Uh, so if you are able to come along that evening, we, will, we would like to see you. And to that end, if you are a parent in the congregation here in the church or up in the hall and you're intending to send your children or you know somebody who is, there are consent forms uh, available at the back of the church and indeed at the back of the hall for you to take away and to fill in and bring them with you on that first evening just to uh, speed up the process slightly. Those forms are also downloadable from the church website. So if you don't get a copy here and you remember when you're home, please you can go online and download them print them off and, and fill them in and bring them in that first evening on sunday the 7th of november we will god willing be celebrating communion uh, so next sunday the 31st communion tokens will be available uh, for you communicant members to pick up and bring home and fill in uh, and to bring back the following week that's a, that's a repeat of what we did the last time. It just speeds the process up and, and with COVID-19, et cetera, et cetera, as well. We just need to be careful. So please bring those home with you and fill them in and bring them back. If you're like me, however, and you forget to bring them back, uh, yeah, which I remember whilst I'm sitting in the pew, uh, please don't worry, we will have a, a few additional ones should that happen. At 7.30 that evening, we will, God willing, hold our traditional thanksgiving service over in Glenhoy at 7.30 p.m. And at the end of that service, we will be holding communion for those who were unable to attend communion in the morning. So please bear that in mind. You see our, our, our notice on there on that sheet about the um, student per, per partnership. I'll leave, those, that to read, I leave you to read the details as per that sheet. But please, can I ask parents or, and children, our young people, or indeed prayer partners to do your fill in those details update those details by the end of the month so i can take them away and uh, republish the updated ones finally with regards to COVID 19 should you test positive between now and the end of next week please let me know so that i can in turn let those know who are sat in close proximity to yourself so at this stage i always say have a good look around you to see who's before and behind you and in front of you so if i have to ask you that question you can tell me that those are the people I need to contact. Those are all the announcements. We've got here to worship God, but we do so with much to distract us, coming as we are from busy lives. So let us refocus our minds, and to do that, we're going to read from God's Word. In Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 34, we read the following. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died 
more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Let us now stand to sing, bring our praise to God in our opening hymn. Glory be to God the Father. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us all bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, loving and eternal Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, seated upon your heavenly throne, we give you thanks for granting us this opportunity. What a great privilege! It is to come before the one who created and rules over all things. The one who sees and knows all things. And for whom nothing is a mystery or impossible. Your understanding has no limits. Your power has no boundaries that it cannot breach. Your knowledge has no gaps. And your sovereignty has no areas that it does not cover. To us, O oh Lord, you are incomprehensible. With our human minds, we simply cannot fathom your greatness. And nor can we comprehend how, despite having absolute power and authority, you also exhibit such amazing grace towards us. Our sins may be many, O Lord, but your mercy is always more. We have a fickle, faint-hearted faith, but you never give up on us. You never give in. You never abandon us. Your patience with us is immeasurable, and your love for us is completely unjustified. 
You don't need us, O Lord. We cannot enhance your existence in any way, nor are we crucial to the implementation of your sovereign will. But yet, O Lord, you choose to reveal yourself to us, to make us aware of our sin and need of salvation, and to tell us how we can be saved. You delight, O Lord, when we trust in you, when we stop wrestling for control of our lives and let you be Lord of all. You delight when we stop trying to justify ourselves before you and let you do so when we come before you washed in the blood of your Son, the Lamb of God, slain at Calvary. You delight, O Lord, when by faith we accept the gift of salvation you offer us instead of trying to earn it for ourselves. Who are we, O Lord, that you should be so merciful towards us? Who are we that you should lavish us with such love and faithfulness? Heavenly Father, despite who you are and all that you do and have done for us, we are quick to forget these things. We are quick to judge you and doubt you when life is not how we want it to be. We are quick to forget about your glory and majesty, your power and authority. So forgive us for these sins and the many others which we commit through thought, word and deed. Help us this day, O Lord, to catch a glimpse of your glory and so enable us to worship you wholeheartedly simply because you are Almighty God, Creator and Lord of all. Hear us our prayer now. In the name of your Son and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, could I encourage you to open them at our reading, which is taken from Matthew chapter 7, as we continue to look at Christ's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew chapter 7, and we will begin reading at verse 13. Once again, this is another well-known passage of Scripture. Matthew 7, beginning at verse 13, and these are the words of our Saviour Jesus Christ as he spoke to the crowd. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road, that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road, that leads to life, and only a few find it. And we end our reading there at verse 14, and thank God for this reading from his truth. Now, boys and girls, I want to speak to you for a few moments. I've got some items here which I know about which you'll be able to identify easily because every person I know has these items or some of these items in their household. So just excuse me as I get them out of the bag. What have we got here? Any checkers? What do you think it is? What is it? A toothbrush, well done. Okay, then what about this? Toothpaste. See, I told you it was easy. And this stuff you might, some people have this, some people don't. Very thin stuff you place between your teeth. Maybe Daddy help you out with this one. Floss, tooth floss, thank you. And finally, mouthwash, that's right, mouthwash. So I told you it was easy, but okay, now, you know what these items are, these things are, but can you tell me what they're used for? What do you use all of these things for? Cleaning your teeth, well done, that's right. Hands up here, including adults, who cleans their teeth? Okay, we've got a 100% strike rate at the moment. Okay. Who cleans their teeth once a day? One hand. Is that 
in the morning or at night. At night, hands up who cleans your teeth twice a day, adults. Okay. Is that in the morning and then again at night before you go to bed? Yes. Hands up who cleans them more than twice a day. Oh, a few extra, a few really diligent people here. Okay then, if you clean your teeth in the morning, do you clean them before you eat breakfast or after? Hands up who do so before. A few. Hands up who do so after. A few others. Now, cleaning your teeth is important, isn't it? It's important because if we do not clean our teeth properly, then we would have to have fillings put in them or we might even have to have them taken out because they may start to decay and rot and have to be taken out. And if we have to take them out, then we might have to have false teeth put in. So, listen carefully. Hands up who can take their teeth out to clean them. <laughs> I have a friend in ministry who used to work for Belfast City Mission. And he visited a house one day and the lady of the house had lost her teeth. So he then spent half an hour looking for said teeth and found them down the back of the settee. So hands up who has put, found their, or lost their teeth down the back of the settee. <laughs> who said ministry was boring, eh? <laughs> so cleaning your teeth is important. But it has to be. It has to be done properly, otherwise it's a waste of time. For instance, if I simply took this toothbrush and did this, Is that cleaning your teeth properly? No, it isn't. What did I not do? What? I didn't put toothpaste on, that's right. So imagine for a moment, I'm not going to put it on because Murphy's Law states it'll fall off all over me and all over the suit and all over the computer and stuff. So I've imagined I applied a little bit of toothpaste to this. So I've got it on there. Is this, is this the proper way to clean your teeth? Was that doing it properly? Yes, no? No. What did I not do? Adults help us out here. Pardon? Scrub them, that's right. You need to scrub them. Okay, you need to scrub. You need to take your time, don't you? Very carefully. Get runs right at the back. Okay, on the sides, insides as well, and you have to make funny faces in the mirror. Do all those things you have to do. Reach the ones at the very back. Yes, despite what people may think, I still have my wisdom teeth. Okay. So, that's using your toothbrush. If I took my tooth floss then, broke a little bit off, and just did between the odd tooth. Would that be doing it right? Or do I have to do it between every tooth? What do you reckon? <coughs> Shout out the answer in the hall if you know the answer. <laughs> every tooth. Yes, you have to do it between every tooth. And what about this mouthwash? If I simply took a gulp of this and then spat it straight out again, is that what you meant to do? No, what are you meant to do? What do you reckon you might do with this? Any checkers? You're about to swirl it around your mouth. That's right. You might take the required amount, and then you meant to go for twenty to thirty seconds, and then careful not to swallow any of it. Uh, as I was reminded in Glen Hoy, then you spit it out down the sink. Okay. That's what you need to do. So if we want to clean our teeth properly, we need to use all of these things the right way. Otherwise, we're just wasting our time, aren't we? We may think that we've cleaned our teeth, but when the dentist go, we, has a look in there and tells that we need to have lots of fillings, he turns up with the drill. Or we need to have some teeth taken out, he turns up with the pliers. Then we know that what we were doing didn't work. You know, boys and girls, the Bible tells us that there is only one way by which we can have our sins washed away from us. 
And that is so that, so that God is no longer angry with us. He no longer sees our sin. And the only way that this can happen, the Bible tells us, is if we say sorry to God and ask Jesus to become our saviour, to take away our sin. Nothing else works, boys and girls. Only Jesus can wash away our sin. So the next time, this evening, before you go to bed, when you're washing your teeth, just remember that unless you do so properly, you aren't really cleaning your teeth. And unless you ask Jesus to be your saviour, your sins will not be washed away either. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus can wash away our sins. And Lord, as we have been thinking about brushing our teeth properly, help us to remember that just as we have to brush our teeth properly to clean them properly, Lord, help us to recognize and realize that only Christ can wash away our sin. Amen. And now we're going to stand to sing our, the children's song, which is "One Way God Said to Get One Way God Said to Get to Heaven." This is a, a, a one that we've sung at Holiday Bible Club before. The adults may some adults may know it, some may not. It's an easy tune to catch on. Children are free to go to children's church, so please let us stand to sing. Let us bow before God in prayer once again. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we unite our hearts in prayer once again, we do so this time to bring our petitions to you. Lord, we lift our government before you. As our nation continues to be in the grip of the COVID-19 pandemic, is now being subjected to a huge spike in energy costs and has a shortage of workers in the food supply chain, among other things. We pray, Lord, that you would grant our government the wisdom and courage to deal with these issues effectively. We pray that effective measures to curb the spread of COVID-19, which don't unduly impact the economy, would be devised and implemented. <clears throat> We pray that the strain on our National Health Service, which is currently stretched to breaking point, would ease sufficiently to take the pressure off the exhausted workforce. We pray for the wholesale price of energy, such as gas and oil, to drop to a more affordable cost and so reduce the adverse knock-on effects to the economy as a whole. We pray especially for our farmers who have seen the price of feed, electricity, gas and oil rise substantially, but yet the price they are paid for their produce does not rise to reflect, or does not reflect this rise in costs. We pray, Lord, that you would enable them to make a sustainable return on their produce. Heavenly Father, we also pray for the United Nations Climate Change Summit, which is due to take place next week in Glasgow. 
We recognise, O Lord, that our actions have had an adverse effect on the climate of our world. So we pray that effective common sense policies will be devised to address this issue. All too often, O Lord, policies are devised which may work in an urban environment, but not in a rural setting such as ours. So we pray that sensible, achievable targets will be set to deal with this problem. As a church, O Lord, we pray for your blessing upon our work here in the Clogher Valley. All around us, O Lord, people are dead in their sin, unaware that they are heading to a lost eternity. Help us, O Lord, to reach them with the good news of the gospel. Give them eyes to see, ears to hear, and minds to understand so they may receive and accept your great invitation to be saved. Protect us from falsehood. Help us, O Lord, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Finally, O Lord, we pray for those of our number and those known to us in the wider community who are currently unwell. Lay your healing touch upon them, O Lord, and grant their anxious loved ones your peace and reassurance, we pray. And these things we ask in our Saviour's name. Amen. If you were given the option of doing something, an easy way or difficult way, we will naturally opt for the easy way. Who, after all, prefers hardship over getting it easy? For instance, if you were trying to lose weight and you were given the option of simply taking a tablet every morning or getting up early each day and doing a 5-10 to 10 mile run followed by observing a very strict diet, I can guarantee that every one of us would be opting for taking the tablet. But in being given those two options, if you were told by an expert that only one of them, namely the difficult way, would enable you to achieve your aim, then that would change which option we would choose. Wouldn't it? I mean, who wants to do something, no matter how easy it may be, if it has been pointed out to us beforehand that it will end in failure? Who would take the tablet? if they knew that it would not enable them to shed any weight. Avoiding something that we know or that we have been told will end in failure is, after all, common sense, is it not? But if we are able to make such rational decisions in our day-to-day -day living, you would think that when it comes to the matter of salvation, how we can have our sins forgiven and be granted a place in heaven, that we would be able to make a similar sensible decision. But is that the case? Well, unfortunately, when we consider Christ's words recorded for us by Matthew in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7, we can see that it isn't. Jesus spoke these words to a group of people after he had explained to them the values and standards of the kingdom of heaven, which are to define its citizens. And having done so, he then taught them how, as citizens of the heavenly kingdom, they can live by those values and standards. He told them that living in such a way was only possible if they asked their heavenly Father for help, if they sought to know and become familiar with God's ways, and if they remained resolute in living as his child of faith. He encouraged them to ask, seek, and knock with the assurance that God would never fail to provide them with what they needed in their journey through life. Then, upon having done this, he taught them what is contained in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7. And therein Christ taught his listeners about two routes and two destinations. Two routes and two destinations. 
the two routes that Christ spoke of are the small or narrow gate which leads onto a narrow road and the wide gate that leads onto a broad road. But what does he mean by terms such as narrow and broad? Well, let's begin with narrow first. When we think of a narrow way, we, or when we think of narrow, we must not think of it as something that is difficult to get through or to find. A narrow gate is, is restrictive, yes, but in the sense that Jesus meant here, it points to limited choice <clears throat> rather than limited access. Back at the beginning of August, when, Taliban, when the Taliban swept aside government forces and seized control of, of Afghanistan following the withdrawal of Allied troops, we witnessed harrowing scenes as people who had worked for the previous government and NATO forces tried to flee the country. We saw how thousands of men, women and children made their way to the airport in Kabul, see, hoping to catch a flight to salvation out of there. For those who made their way to the gate controlled by British troops, they had to pass along a narrow passageway between a steel shipping container on the wall before getting to a single gate. Many thousands passed through that gate. So you see, it was restrictive. It was not restrictive in terms of numbers, only in terms of the fact that it was the only means by which they could escape the Taliban and gain access to a new life in Britain. If they tried any other gate, they failed. Therefore, <clears throat> In referring to the narrow gate, or the gate as narrow, Jesus was pointing out that it is the only gate through which people can gain access to the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Elsewhere in scripture, in John chapter 10 and verse 9, we are told that Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. <clears throat> <clears throat> Jesus could say those words, because he came into this world to die for sin and rise again. He alone vanquished sin and death, so he alone can provide us with salvation. In the words of the Apostle Peter, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. <clears throat> The narrow gate leads onto a narrow road, and again, we must be careful not to imply a false meaning to this. <clears throat> narrow, in this sense, has a dual meaning, in that, in that not only, it not only implies constraint, but also difficulty. However, we must not take the latter out of context. The difficulty implied here does not mean that only an elite few will make it. It's not akin to some rigorous selection process that thins out those who don't have what it takes. The difficulty in view here, rather, is a direct result of the fact that when we put our faith in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, we are called to a life of discipleship, which compels us to deny ourselves and live for Christ. The way of discipleship is narrow in that we cannot simply live as we please, but Rather, we are to strive to be holy as our Heavenly Father is holy. This will mean sacrifice and being subjected to the hardship of battling temptation. It may also involve dealing with hardships such as the pain of being ridiculed and rejected by others who don't take too kindly to our life in Christ. But another aspect of narrow here is that the narrow way constrains us to stay united with Christ. When people who do a tandem parachute jump leave the aircraft, if they want to reach the ground safely, they have to remain connected to the parachutist by the harness. They have no option but to, otherwise they will plummet to their death. And in a similar sense, we cannot jettison Christ. In the hours before his death, Jesus emphasized this very point to his disciples because as he, as he spoke to them in the upper room, he said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, 
he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. As a branch draws nourishment and life from the tree to which it is connected, so too do those who have put their faith in Christ. As Christians, citizens of the heavenly kingdom, we are called to live a life that brings glory to God. But we cannot do so apart from Christ. So that is what Jesus meant by narrow. Next we have the terms wide and broad. Now I don't have to tell you that a wide gate is the opposite to a narrow one. Therefore as the narrow gate that Jesus spoke of meant limited choice with regards to accessing salvation, the wide one offers no such restriction. In other words, people can choose to believe what they like about how they can be saved. Is this not the prevailing view of most people in our world today? Most people who profess to believe in God will also say that they believe they will get to heaven even though they have no personal faith in Christ. They believe that they are, are acceptable to God as they are. That in the grand scheme of things, when compared to people who they regard as really evil, they're not that bad. And therefore, they believe that God has nothing really to forgive them for. Others reject the idea of God altogether. So they don't believe that they need to be saved from anything. Then there are others who recognize their sinfulness, but they believe that they can earn their way into God's good books, as it were. By observing certain religious practices such as praying, such as going to church, paying to charities, etc. There are, are, there are also those who are also, they observe other religious beliefs. Those who reject Almighty God and instead believe in a false God, whom they believe will see them all right in the end. So the wide gate does not restrict people's beliefs. It lets people believe what they want to. The wide gate leads, we are told, onto a broad road, which again doesn't limit people in what they believe. Among the many different types of travellers on this road, you will find people who profess to have put their faith in Christ, but by their own admission, do not take their faith seriously. In other words, they believe that asking God to forgive them now and again is all that their faith requires. But they don't have to change the way in which they live. Joanne recently told me of a news item she had read where a woman who worked as a stripper said that she was a Christian and that God had told her she could continue working as a stripper. Such people, in essence, believe that God's word is open to interpretation. In other words, that we can interpret how we want to, so that it suits our lifestyle, or that we can ignore certain sections of it that challenge our sinfulness. The white gate is the one that Jesus said many go through. And that is because it asks nothing of those who go through it. It enables them to indulge themselves and live as they want to. The narrow gate is the one that Jesus said only a few pass through. But not because they have difficulty finding it, but rather because it demands all who pass through it to live not for themselves, but for Christ. It demands that they turn from their life of sin and strive to live for Christ. Those are the two routes, and they both lead to two very different destinations. The wide gate and broad, broad road, we are told, leads to destruction. Well, it's a small gate, and narrow road leads to life. Now, as we consider these words here, we need to recognize who spoke them. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, if ever there was an expert qualified to speak on this topic, Christ is that expert. He, as the Son of God, understood the seriousness of sin because he came into the world to lay down his life, to make the perfect sacrifice required by God 
to atone for sin. He knew that God, because of his holiness, has no option but to destroy sin. Therefore, he cannot have anyone in his presence who has not been washed in the blood of his Son to remove their sins. Jesus himself faced his heavenly Father's wrath when he took our sin upon himself at the cross of Calvary. So as these are his words, ought we not to take them seriously? But Jesus did not speak these words here to terrify people. Rather, he did so to warn them about the consequences of disobeying God, just as God has done right throughout human history. For example, he told Adam and Eve in the garden, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. And speaking through the writer of Proverbs, God declared there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. In other words, if we ignore God's word and do things our own way, it will end in God rejecting us in eternity, just as we have rejected him in this life. But God in his mercy does not simply point out that as sinners we would be subject to his righteous wrath. He also tells us that there is a way by which we can be saved, having provided that very way for us through faith in Christ. Jesus Christ said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I wonder as you sit before me, or as you listen to this, which route are you on today? Are you on the one that leads to the eternal life or the one that leads to destruction? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we consider these words here, we are prone, O Lord, to complain that you that the way to salvation is narrow, as Christ described it here. Because it forces us to deny ourselves and live for Christ. But in thinking like that, Heavenly Father, we forget that you are gracious in providing us with a way at all. Therefore, we thank you that you have. Lord, help us to hear Christ's words and to heed Christ's words. Amen. Now we're going to stand to sing our closing hymn, Oh, for a Closer Walk with God.
And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon and abide with you forevermore. Amen.